Hello everyone, my name is Ben and this is Uncharted X. Welcome to the podcast. I've got a real treat today. I am sitting down and talking with Dr. Martin Swetman, who works at the University of Edinburgh. He holds a degree in theoretical physics, and he also happens to be the author of a fantastic new book called Prehistory Decoded. It takes a detailed look at much of the Paleolithic cave art, as well as the megalithic art that is at places like Gobleki Tepe, and organizes all of these things into a coherent system of zodiacal and precession of the equinox dating. It's a real game changer that connects a lot of dots about what happened, in particular along with the Younger Dryas Cataclysm and the timing for that. In terms of other channel news, please stay tuned. I have a lot of uploads coming this weekend, I hope. I am working away on a number of different videos. If you like what I'm doing and you'd like to see more, please do remember to give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and please do consider supporting the channel at unchartedx.com slash support. Enjoy the podcast. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Ben, and this is Uncharted X. I'm delighted to say that I'm being joined by Martin Swetman today, who has a doctorate in theoretical physics. He also holds a teaching position at the University of Edinburgh, I believe, in chemical engineering. And he's also written what is a game-changing book, for me at least, about Gobleki Tepe, as well as the interpretation of many other ancient Neolithic and megalithic artwork, uh, and looking at that from a a zodiacal procession of the equinox date marker type of thing. He's also got a few peer-reviewed papers uh, talking about his work. And I'm just happy that you're here, Martin. Cheers. How are you doing? Uh, Thank you very much, Ben, for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here too. Yeah. Yeah, it's great to talk to you. I've, I've, Like I said, I've been getting into your work. I heard about it a little while ago, uh, I think, on Twitter. And a few other people sent me information and sent me uh, links to your stuff. And I've just been fascinated by it. I've, I've watched all your videos on the YouTube channel, which is excellent, by the way. Everyone out there, if you, you haven't seen Martin's work, go and check out his YouTube channel. It's a great introduction to uh, to what he's doing. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank thank you very much, Ben. Um, yeah, I'm I'm a scientist, obviously, and uh, I try and uh, try and keep things scientific. So, um, you know, I try and, and I'll read the the research literature and, and use that primarily as the basis uh, for my research. It's excellent. Yeah. I, I, it's a weird progression for me. I, it's a question I, I wanted to ask you. Like, how does one go from a doctorate in theoretical physics and a teaching position looking at chemical engineering to writing a book about Gobleki Tepe. Um, it seems like a strange path. Yeah, it is. I guess it is a bit strange. Um, uh, you know, I like lots of people. I'm interested in all sorts of things. Um, mysteries of the world, you might call it. I was the I was the sort of kid that grew up watching Arthur C. Clarke mysteries on TV. So these things have always interested me, whether it was, I remember a long time ago, um, you know, when I was a kid, I, I remember reading about the Tunguska event uh, even yes. then, and it's kind of, kind of stuck in my mind. Uh, and even though I didn't really know what was, what it was all about then, it's only later when I discovered that that was some kind of comet or asteroid impact. So, so these things that, you know, they've always, um, it's always been an interest. And then I think it was, um, uh, well, I'd been, fo- I heard about Gebeki Tepe when it was, made public about 2005 i believe and so i've been following i've been following the news on that you know reading research papers uh, and anything that came out on gobeki tepe and then of course graham's book magicians of the gods came out uh, where he began the decoding of gobeki tepe and uh, i saw straight away that this was really interesting and uh, it deserved a a much closer look Uh, and so that's where it basically that's where it all kicked off and uh, i've kind of fallen down my rabbit hole if you know what i mean um, <laughs> I, I 100% do understand <laughs> that uh, that process yeah i've been through one myself similar similar yeah. to it so it's, it's like an alternate universe a little bit and uh, but you know i'm, I'm I, even though there is this alternate universe apparently i am still as much as i can trying to stick to the you know to the published research and yes. trying to remain scientific about it i think it deserves that actually i think that's that's a I, really important thing that um, that we need to try and do. I, I 100% agree, and it's it is the approach that I try to take in the stuff that I do too. Like my when I look at these sites, I mean, I'm not. I, I have a degree. I mean, way back in the day, Bachelor of Science, sure, and but I went off went on to do IT for 20 odd years. But I've always been sort of a, a, a stickler for that method and the the, the idea that you know a hypothesis to you know experiment result. You need there's a there's a method in the, in the way that we look at these things and. 
I and the one thing that I that I really try to focus on is just being open minded to any all potential conclusions because for me this the whole big picture is <clears throat> it has to do with the extension of the human timeline. We continue like it's a it's I, the analogy I like to use. It's like a a murder case that never ends, right? We're continually evaluating new evidence in terms of what's the story of human origins and what's the story of our history on the planet. And, you know, the, the court's duty is to kind of have the best idea of the truth as it stands today, because every time we dig something up, Go Blecky Tepe was one of the big game changers just in general. But, you know, we've, we're pushing human timelines back further and further. Everything seems to get older and older. And then, of course, the big clangor in the whole story, which is the Younger Dryas, which to me is also something that has just come up in the last 20 years that should be fundamentally shifting our view of human history. Yeah, I mean, as I, I'm aware in my own research that there are surprises. That's that's why we do research. That's why it's interesting. Right. There are surprises now and then that come along, and and uh, you know the, the the research community investigates, and uh, you know, after a while, you know, there's lots of toing and froing, and then after a while, that that kind of moves on, and that that is resolved. But something that doesn't seem to have happened to the same extent, or at least that there's a much sort of bigger story here with this right. with this sort of ancient archaeology and our ancient sort of prehistory it's it's a really massive story that, that a lot of people are interested in and the a problem i see with it is that in certain quarters that it hasn't re, hasn't got the um the kind of level of scientific inquiry that it, yeah. it that it deserves i'm not i'm you know obviously that we've got you know, good climate scientists and geologists and so on but uh, yeah i'm talking more of in the sort of humanities area right there's a lack of what I would say, really good scientific inquiry. And I think that's probably what you're alluding to. And that a lot of what we think we know is actually, a lot of it is just opinion. That's that's right. I, I'm fond of saying in my videos that it's there's a difference between what I'd call a, a hard science, which is chemistry, physics, where you have this clear you know hypothesis experiment result, it's repeatable. And then you have archaeology history and they're it's hard to really classify those in my mind as a science almost that they're, they're very close to as you say humanities arts studies study of language it's an interpretation of what you see and what we know is written down and we try to piece it together so it's, it, it's at some level it's always a story uh and in my opinion uh we we used to be a lot more open-minded to that so if you go back a couple of 150 200 years say for looking at egyptologists and petrie and and their explorations at giza for example i mean when they saw something that they didn't know what it was things like the drill cores and some of the evidence for this advanced techniques in machining they knew that they didn't know what they were looking at and they said so and they're, they're, they're like we have no idea how this was done but today's day and age it's I, I kind of blame the internet and the, the nature of discourse itself a little bit because of, for this, but it, to me it seems like we're much more, if I was to tag the whole establishment or orthodox version of history, it's, it's very more authoritarian because you almost have to be just to, in order to, to have that discourse now in a public space. The, the discourse has shifted from university uh, and academic realms to now it's, well, anyone can go on YouTube, idiots like me can go out there and say their piece and have people listen. And, you know, it's, so it's hard to... To, I think hard to admit there's a lot of realms that we really don't know. And that, that's my conclusion from looking at this for several years now is, is that it's, it's a big mystery and, and there's lots of unknowns. And I think we should be open-minded in how we investigate this stuff. And if we were like in, in, in the way that you're doing is a great example because we're learning stuff. Like you've, you've, there's some really revelationary stuff that you've found out about, about Gobleki Tepe. And it's not only that, but you've, you've kind of scientifically verified it that this is extremely likely to be the, the the case as subjective as it is but it's 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 extremely likely to get to be true i like and i love your st statistical model we'll get into that later on but yeah so that's at least how i look at it yeah i mean I, there is a i'm sure there's a very interesting history of science story here right? yeah. which i haven't quite figured it out you, you mentioned a couple of the drivers there the internet uh and i think it's yeah there's there's something there's more to it than that i think yeah. i suspect my my view is that perhaps some of this goes back to creationism. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and that uh, that's that kind of led to this battle between creationists and then you know evolutionary biologists has led to a kind of stiffening of resolve amongst um, academics, if you like, uh, and that they have to be kind of more um, dogmatic right. in their approach uh, towards the public. And I 
I think that was that, if if that is the case, mm. then that's probably um, a wrong strategy. I yeah, I think so. And I and <clears> I <throat> I've I've tried to tell the story a couple of times, not to divert too far from 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 your work, but there's a. Uh, I, I, the creationism is exactly the, and catastrophism, in fact, is because it goes along with creationism, right? There was the age of enlightenment where science was rising and trying to separate itself from religion, which was the de facto answer to all the unknowns at the time. And you have you have this all of this catastrophism that's embedded in in religion. And it turns out today, we, we younger Dries is teaching us there's a grain of truth in that. But back then, it was like we need to separate ourselves as far as we can from this catastrophism stuff and i think there's, there's a one discipline in particular that has suffered from that is geology uh i just think that there was this concept of uniformitarianism and gradualism that was a stated goal for like 60 years in the 19th century and that's still in, in a lot of cases what's in the textbook today and but yet the uh the much more elegant and simplified solution is like well actually a lot of this stuff we're seeing was caused by a catastrophic flood it wasn't caused by long periods of erosion and just the the gradual processes that we see at work on the planet today, hence gradualism. And I think that's, uh, we're still trying to figure out where the, the truth lies between these two domains. Yeah, I think we're on the same page. You know, I think cool. okay, you won't find any disagreement with me there. It's, um, it's like you say, it's, it's a very long, it's been a very long history to this. And I think that the truth is kind of somewhere between these two extreme camps. On the one right. hand, the sort of very dogmatic academics, and on the, on the other hand, the sort of extreme imaginations of yeah. um, some people. Oh, <laughs> I, I agree. Not, not name anyone. Yeah. Uh, and I think the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. You know. So I, I guess we'll come to that in, in a minute. I, I, yes, we will. I, I, I know I absolutely agree with that too. It's, it's an interesting field playing around. And any time you, you, you step into the history side and you say, well, this is alternative history, you, you immediately put yourself in a, in a large bag of all sorts of different things. So I'm, I'm very, I try to stay very careful in terms of not, not having any agenda to push. And you can say, well, it's angels, aliens, giants, crystal, whatever, right? There's, I just think it's let's follow the evidence, let's try and learn what we can, which leads us back to Gobleki Tepe, which for people that don't know, I'm sure most people who are listening do know, it's a recently discovered megalithic site in Turkey, the largest megalithic site in the world from what I understand. It's only had 5% or so actually excavated that, that your work is based on. It's a huge site, but carbon dated to at least, what is it, 12,000 years, years old, uh, deliberately buried. Yeah, I think the earliest radiocarbon date is for mortar from enclosure D. So the, there's like a, a wall yep. that uh, encircles enclosure D. And I think it's um, 9,500 and something BC is the earliest radiocarbon date. And the, the error in that is a few hundred years. Right. Um, yeah. So that's, that's obviously a radiocarbon date. But now um, I think we can use this zodiacal dating method. Uh, to actually take that further back. Now, according to this method, it, it, the, the, this particular pillar that we're talking about, or one of the particular pillars at Gebeki Tepe, known as the Vulture Stone, yep. actually it's, it's called Pillar 43 yep. by the archaeologists. So that's got this date written on it, which I think is the Younger Dryas event date, uh, which appears to be about 10,900, 10,800 BC. Uh, so that's that's a date written on the stone, but we can't actually use that to date when the stone was made because obviously right. it could have been made significantly after the event right. happened. We, we don't know how long. You know, it could have been 10 years, it could have been 100 years or 1,000 years. We just don't know. Uh, but nevertheless, there is that date. Yeah, and that's the thing, radiocarbon dating. We need organic remains, right, for that to happen. Stone doesn't, doesn't fall into that. Have they done any of the uh, the solar radiation tests on those stones, do you know? I know there's a new method that's come out in terms of trying to date, like cut stone surfaces that, that you can date by exposure to sunlight. Oh, that, and I know it's a challenge with Gobleki Tepe given that it was all underground and you're not absorbing solar radiation, but do you know if there's been any efforts to date some of the stonework using those methods? Uh, I don't believe there has. So I think um, I think that's called stimulated luminescence that's it it's yep. not it's not a, it's not a technique i know a great deal about um but i think w what happens is um that um there are particular kinds of uh, crystal uh, quartz is, is, i think is one example yeah. which which appear in stone uh which um dis they can build up charge over time when it's dark but but they discharge that charge uh when they uh when they when they litter so yeah. 
Um, so whilst this stone block, if it's got some crystal uh, um, structures in it, so whilst it's dark, so whilst it's sort of sitting and um, it's in a sort of dark space, then it, it can be building up its charge inside these little crystals. Uh, but then as soon as you open it to the uh, to the sunlight, it discharges. So if you carry out some kind of measurement in the dark of right. how much charge these crystals are, are storing, then you can um, estimate the time since they were last exposed to light. Oh. And my, I've read a couple of papers on this, and it's I think it's becoming pretty well established now. Uh, my understanding is that the error, or the uncertainty, I should say, in those measurements is still quite large. Mm -hmm. So, for example... A really good example, actually, was um, I think that that kind of dating has been used for some granite blocks that um, in, in case um, some of the sand, yes, um, some of the limestone blocks uh -huh. of, of the Sphinx Temple. Indeed. So it was so the, the granite contains the, the little um, quartz crystals, but they've been but they're sort of in covering the the limestone of this particular temple yeah. and so i think it's been used to date those um granite stones and, and they, the dates came out to be about two and a half to three thousand bc which more or less agrees with the age of um the pyramids it does yeah and i guess the orthodox age of the emergence of the egyptian civilization although it's just it's a fascinating thing to me there's a, a couple interesting things on that that sphinx temple one is that the, i mean again it's a slight diversion but the limestone blocks on the inside are heavily eroded and in some places it's almost as if the the, the granite's been shaped to fit the erosion it's not a, a, that's a right. joining and that's it's like well what is going on here it was this is this a renovation at that point is it yeah what what what's the deal <laughs> right that's my printer just started. <laughs> if you could hear something in the background. Something fired off, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the Sphinx, yeah, I, get, getting back to those granite blocks, you're, you're right. So I, um, at least that's what I understand from, from reading Robert Schock's uh, latest or one of his latest books right. about the origin of the Sphinx. So, um, yeah, uh, and, and I've read the paper as well that that, that was based on. So, uh, in fact, the author of that paper on the on thermal on stimulated luminescence of those blocks around the sphinx is um is a professor yanis Luritsis, who is actually editor of the journal of mediterranean archaeology and archaeometry oh. which is where my fox paper was published <laughs> yes yeah yeah i i liked your papers actually i i i enjoy i do the same i try to read a lot of the scientific papers i had a whole video looking at the younger dryas impact uh the latest paper in the southern hemisphere which i thought was excellent work but yeah I, I i've been tempted to to do the same thing to one of your papers and just go through it in some detail i, I may yet i may yet do that as a video but so with oh, go great. with go blecky tepe i know that and i know your work's not just based on go blecky tepe it's one of the uh one of the 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 proof points if you like for for looking at artwork you, it also refers to sort of paleolithic artwork in the european cave systems as well as perhaps some other um, places around the world. But I think most of what you're known for, and particularly this, this, this prehistory decoded book, is focused on Gobleki Tepe, yes? Yeah, so Gobleki Tepe is, is the key to all of this. Um, so I think I mentioned it before that I saw, I read Graham Hancock's book where yep. he uh, describes, I think it was an idea by Paul Burley, where uh, it, it, it sort of matches the scorpion to Scorpius and then the eagle vulture to Sagittarius. Right. And then I think Graham takes it one further and he matches the sort of bending bird with fish to the Ophiuchus con um, constellation. Uh, and so when I, I read that, I thought, wow, OK, yeah, but that, that's pretty, pretty good. It could be, you know, mm -hmm. but um, it could also be coincidence. You know, as a scientist, you have to be wary that these things can easily just be coincidence. So that's that's what I then took that as a starting point and, and just went to, just tried to see how far we could we could take it, you know, what. What other things match up? How can we interpret the other symbols? Uh, and that, then it all just fell into place within a couple of days, really. Right. Um, decoding that pillar, and then if there were some other pillars that uh, took a little bit longer as well, that also sort of really corroborate what we're we're saying. But that was just the start. So, uh, and that all that, that was really exciting, really. Yeah. Uh, incredibly exciting. Uh, but that was just the start. So I knew that. Um, the people that built those stones at Gebekli Tepe, uh, they couldn't have just come up with this scheme from nowhere. 
precession of the equinoxes is a very slow process and it would have taken hundreds if not thousands of years for them to have gained the confidence to have used this method in such an important place like Gebekli Tepe. So this had to have had uh, a backstory to it, which probably went back thousands of years. Mm -hmm. I also knew that it's unlikely that it's, it was it stopped at Gebekli Tepe. That it, it was probably this system must have been used elsewhere, further, um, you know, closer to us in time. So, yeah, I looked around at all sorts of different places. Uh, I had a few help, had a bit of help with some with um, from some friends, notably Alistair Coombs, got in touch with me, and so he pointed me in the direction of um, Chattel Hoyuk, which was an important yep. place. Mm -hmm. So we were able to decode a few more symbols from Chattel Hoyuk, and then I began to look backwards in time because I could see that. Um, Okay, there is like a there's like a path between Gebekli Tepe and the Bronze Age, which we can you can sort of just about make out through nice. Mesopotamia and the Near East. There are various places there where this, this this sort of trail of this symbolism goes. But what about back in time? And so you you see the animal symbols at Gebekli Tepe, and then you see the animal symbols in the Paleolithic art, art, and you think, well, okay, may, maybe they're the same. And it turns out they are. <laughs> so oh wow! Yeah. That that was the. That was a crazy thing. You're not, not, not at all expecting this to work out, but started looking at um, known radiocarbon dates for these different animal symbols in, in the cave art and then correlating that with our the zodiac, which we'd already worked out. And it just kept on matching up. And I thought, well, when is this going to stop? And I kept on looking at one symbol after another, going back further in time to older and older caves, and it kept on matching up. Uh, and so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the, re the really, in really, um, really cool thing was that when I first did this exercise, I used an old radiocarbon calibration curve. So in order, when you have a radiocarbon measurement, you then have to use a calibration curve to turn it into a, a true age, if you like. And so there are, over time, scientists have been developing these radiocarbon calibration curves. And they're getting more accurate as time goes by but originally the first one i used i think was from 2005 and although most of the symbols matched up there were a few that didn't there were a few that um were quite far away of where i thought they should be according to our this hypothesis and then i thought well what if we use a modern radiocarbon calibration curve and everything just fell into place then it was like perfect wow. so i knew wow. that it, you know it had to be the had to be true so this goes back all the way as far as we can tell, well, at least it still agrees with the hypothesis. If you go back to, um, it's the oldest piece of sculpture I think that we know of, which is the the Lion Man of Holstein Stadel Cave, which was found in uh, well, it's a German cave. Right. It's 38,000 BC, so 40,000 years old, according to the radiocarbon date, and even that agrees with our zodiac. So the Lion Man apparently is representing Cancer. On, on, I think it's the winter solstice for that particular case. Yeah, huh. yeah. That's so. So just to be clear, you're you're matching like the the known radiocarbon dating of ancient uh, both artwork and paintings based on the organic remains, and that lines up with what they're painting in terms of it being a description of the sky during that era. Is that that's what you're saying, like there? Because and you're using the the markers for precession. Uh, being, you know, the, the the solstice, where the sun rises, is that, that or they're using sunrise or sunset? Is there a, what's the, the model for how they map I the procession? Think, I think they're using sunset because all of the animal symbols that they're using, they match the constellations to my eye, and I think other people would agree. Yeah. They match the constellations at sunset, not at sunrise. So at sunrise, they're kind of upside down. Right, at sunset, yeah. they, they yeah. agree perfectly. Right, right, right. And yeah. So I think so. I think what what's happening there is that um, you know. So when 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 um, let's suppose that those ancient people were interested in the summer solstice, they would paint. It, it appears they would paint the constellation corresponding to the summer solstice in their cave, and they might also then paint the winter solstice constellation. But of course, over thousands of years, with the procession of the equinoxes. Uh, things gradually shift, and after a few thousand years, a different constellation becomes the summer solstice, and a different one becomes the winter solstice. And so they paint those animal symbols instead. Yeah. Uh, and so you get this build-up of this this entire zodiac inside the caves. So what we've done in our work is to compare the radiocarbon ages with what we predict from from the zodiac, 
uh, and to see it, it basically it just keeps on agreeing all the time that's that's astonishing that's really cool that's what i like and then your statistic and then to back that up as as because i only I mean i've read some criticisms of your work and they're always like well it's subjective and you can see anything in the sky well that's something you, you guys have always addressed head on and saying that yes this is subjective but if you if you take your hypothesis and you you assume that all right so say this isn't this has got nothing to do with constellations what's the chances that they drew all these all of these objects and shapes just happen to be in these locations that just happen to match just by accident match these uh, the constellations in the sky and i think you arrive at some astronomically uh, uh, absurd yeah. sort of odds figure that that's the case it's it's almost yeah. a scientific certainty that, that that's what they were drawing Exactly that. It's, a, it's a, you know what we might call a scientific certainty. Shall I share wow. my screen? With you? Yeah, I can yeah, show please. you that, that. I can show you that data. Um, right. Let's please see. Do. And yep, you can see me. And yep, yeah, there's your screen. Yeah. So I just need to find that plot. And actually, this will be coming up in my next video. So my last video ah, is yes. exactly about this. I've got four other videos on the YouTube at the moment, and they are more about Gebekli Tepe and the astronomy and the younger Dryas. And the last one will be about the Paleolithic art. And uh, so, actually, if I, if I go back, uh, yeah, here we go. Yeah, start wherever. So I'll, I'll try and explain again what's going on. So what we're saying is that let's suppose that uh, this is the summer solstice and it happens that because of precession of the equinoxes, that at this particular time, Virgo, this is the constellation Virgo, yep. uh, is behind the sun at the summer solstice. Then we're saying that people would be painting this symbol, which turns out to be a bear, actually. So in, in, our, in our zodiac, Virgo is represented by the bear. So they'll be painting bears. But then over time, this sort of wheel, this sort of great year, 26,000 years it takes to complete an entire circle. Yeah, it's one degree every 72 years, right, On the, in terms of where the, how the stars shift. So you only see one That's degree right. of movement in 72 years. This takes a lot of observation and detailed yeah. uh, record That's recording. Right. Yeah. It, it does, yes. But, but one degree, strangely enough, is actually twice the width of the moon. Oh, so it's, it's something that you, you could... <laughs> no, if you were doing it for your entire life, <laughs> yeah. so if you were already tracking the solstices and equinoxes, it's something that you could actually notice without too much difficulty if you uh, lived long enough. Anyway, so let's suppose that um, the people were painting bears, but then after a thousand years, the summer solstice would point to Leo instead, let's say, and then they'd be pointing horses because it's leo corresponds to the horse in this zodiac not the um not the feline but if we wait about um four thousand years the next solstice or equinox would come along and that would then start painting uh, pointing towards uh, the bear constellation or virgo so what we should find in the data is this periodicity where for a, for a couple of thousand years people were painting bears but then bears disappear for about four thousand years before they come back again. And we should see the same with each symbol, that there is this periodicity. And we can actually um, uh, statistically analyze that, as, as you were saying. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we should find is that if we compare the, um, the radiocarbon age of a particular painting, and we compare that with what we expect from, this, from the zodiacal age. So when, I'm, when I say the zodiacal age, I'm talking about the age at the center of that particular constellation. So if it was Virgo, it'd be a time corresponding to about here. If it was Leo, it'd be a time corresponding to the middle of Leo. So if we compare the radiocarbon age with the zodiacal age, then we would expect to see um, uh, a difference in those ages, which is more or less uniformly distributed up to about a thousand years or so, because each constellation is about 2,000 years wide or just right. a little bit more. So they should be uniform up to 1,000 years. And then that should decay basically to zero when basically the, you know, the, the, the um, solstices and equinoxes have moved on to a, a different symbol. Mm -hmm. So that should decay. And the reason it's not a perfectly sharp cliff is because these symbols have different lengths. Some of them are shorter than others. Right. So Cancer where is Cancer? Cancer is quite a short one, actually. It's about 1,500 years, whereas Leo is about 2,500 years in width in yeah, terms of procession. Constellations are different sizes relative to us in the sky, is what you're saying. And, and exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So this distribution should then fall off fairly smoothly to zero, and it should be zero for the rest of the time, up to about 3,222 years, which is exactly one-eighth of the entire 
processional cycle. So if our if our hypothesis is true, that's the expect that's the distribution of age differences between radiocarbon and zodiacal ages for these symbols. Right. If our hypothesis is wrong, there should be no correlation whatsoever, and we should just get a uniform distribution of points up to 3,000 years or so. Mm -hmm. And what we find when we analyze all of these, um, so this is looking at all the data that exists in the peer-reviewed uh, English language uh, research journals, right. and uh, every Every animal symbol that is part of our zodiac, we've analyzed and compared it with its zodiacal, its presumed zodiacal age. So here I'm plotting the difference between the zodiacal age and the radiocarbon age. And as I said, yep. if our hypothesis is true, then we would expect more points in this sort of, in the low difference region than in the high difference region. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we find. Now, actually, you'll see here that there are quite a few other points, but I'll just skip back to this plot again something I didn't mention. Now, this expected distribution, I'm, I'm getting a little bit technical here, but this Fine. expected dis distribution is what we expect if there is no uncertainty in the radiocarbon age. So if those radiocarbon measurements were perfectly precise, this is what we would expect to see, this distribution. However, we know that radiocarbon measurements uh, have quite sometimes quite large uncertainties in them yeah. so what, what's going to happen there is that, that the uncertainty will smear out this distribution and if the uncertainty is too large eventually you won't be able to tell the difference between the expected distribution and the null hypothesis yes. so what that means is that we can only analyze um, animal symbols for which the radiocarbon measurement uncertainty is small enough that we can detect the difference between you know, success and failure so what we do so what we do in our case is we say, well, let's take that to be about a thousand or about about a third of this, one third of this entire difference. Let's take it to be about a thousand years. So any, or a thousand and eighty, I think it is. So any of those radiocarbon measurements, which has got an uncertainty in its age of more than a thousand and eighty years, mm -hmm. we discard. And that corresponds to all of these um, open triangles. I see them. Yeah. So, so all of these open triangles, they have got very large radiocarbon uncertainty so when we when we throw those away what we're left with essentially and there's a, there's one or two other points which we don't have time to go into but yeah. basically what we're left with are all these filled circles that's what we're left with when we throw away the the highly uncertain radiocarbon measurements mm -hmm. and, and and so what you see there is that <laughs> pretty much everything almost everything is underneath this dotted line at about 1450 years that's and you can work out a probability for that happening by pure chance and it turns out to be well at the time we wrote our paper on paleolithic art it was about one in 500 million but since then we've um we've realized that the the stag or the deer represents aquarius and so if you add that into the mix as well then it comes out to be about one in 2.3 billion chance of this occurring by <laughs> pure chance yeah. so it basically in a, in a scientific sense it, our hypothesis is proven. Uh, anyone that doubts this has to provide an explanation right. for why there is this extremely strong correlation. Yeah, I. That's it's 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 it sold me, and my my eyebrows went up when I read. It. In fact, I have a little quote from one of your papers here that I'd like to read. Kind of summarise it. I love this quote because I just was like, this is. This is why science isn't something that requires belief or faith. It requires evidence. And this is this quote from your paper, which is quoting. Through this comparison of predicted and measured dates, we verify our scientific hypothesis to an extraordinary level of statistical confidence, far surpassing the usual demands for publication of scientific results. Therefore, in a scientific sense, we prove our hypothesis is correct. Essentially, our statistical result is so strong that unless a significant flaw in our methodology is found, it would be irrational to doubt our hypothesis. End quote. Exactly. I love that. That's, yeah, that, yeah. that's exactly how science works. Yep. Yeah, I, I just love that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and of course, this is just the statistics of this data set. Right. Um, I also, we also produced another um, estimate of confidence for our work on Gubekli Tepe. And that came out to be about one in 140 million of, that, of, pillar, of the arrangement of symbols on Pillar 43, 43. occurring by pure chance. Now, the problem with that was that that's objective. Right. Sorry, that's a subjective, that particular result. So there was always the case that someone could say, and people have, you know, oh, well, that's, that's just your opinion. And that, that's fine. I, I understand that. 
but I, I still think that um, at least from my point of view, I, I was very confident because I, you know, I can, I can, I can make, I can see that uh, these pattern matches, at least from my point of view, are very good. So yeah. I was confident that this was correct, and it was it, for me, it was just a case of finding some other more evidence that would then confirm it. And, and this happens to be the evidence that we were looking for. Yeah. And it's and the, and the extraordinary thing is just how far back in time it goes, forty thousand yeah. years ago, that um, people, it seems, were still using as far as we can tell, pretty much the same constellations, or they, they might have been stretched a little bit because the stars move in the sky slightly. They have a proper motion. But that for the zodiacal symbols, the proper motion is pretty small. And so it, it appears that they were using the same, pretty much the same constellations we were. Yeah, that's it's astonishing to me. And one of the reasons I liked it, I mean, I, I, I enjoyed this work a, a, a great deal is because it, to me it seems to line up. It's it's another indicator of... of, of it's and I mean again this is this is my opinion but it, it's a uh, it's an indicator of some form of there's a there's something going on that's that's some sort of knowledge that's crossing all of these tens of thousands of years between the people writing doing work in caves to Gobleki Tepe and then potentially after like you said a Chattel Hoyak and stuff which is which is later uh, using that same system and that's just it's kind of, kind of one extra thing that to me is this uh, the, the the another proof point that there are these common commonalities and links between so many different ancient civilizations that just hint at this idea of some maybe some kind of um, shared precursor civilization, if you know what I mean. It's uh, because the, I mean I'm not sure you said you you read Magicians of the Gods, Graham's uh, second book did, uh, on this topic, but have you read Fingerprints of the Gods, his original book from '96? Because that's that that goes into a lot of really interesting details about those commonalities. It it, it he talks a lot about another book called Hamlet's Mill, which is just a fantastic piece of work it's a you know, it's a tough read but it's uh it lines up all of the because procession of the equinox the whole idea of mapping the sky i mean before we had cities and lights this is what people did and the relationship between how we lived on the ground and and to the seasons was just that was a part of everyday life it was it was a it was an indicator of how much you suffered or not so people paid just a, a huge amount of attention to it but that that deep level of of processional knowledge is kind of encoded in a lot of different cultures a lot of different religious myths that span millennia of time and and a lot of distance across the globe and in some cases that that information is buried in these legends and myths from cultures that really as far as we know had no ability to measure these things and they weren't paying that much attention to to be able to notice things like procession it's a real interesting indicator you, he also gets into things like um i don't know if you've you've uh seen this or read this but it's the uh the maps of the ancient sea kings book. It's um, it's a, it's a really good book. It's uh, Charles Hapgood. I think he was a academic as well. But he he looks at mm. there's there's really amazing evidence in the ancient maps that come to us from that have been drawn mm. together from other previous sources that things like accurate depiction, including very accurate mapping of longitude of the coastline of Antarctica that's under a mile of ice today, that you know this and that's the stuff that he that, that Piri raised pulled from ancient source maps now lost to us things like the, the library of alexandria so there's these little hints and clues that something advanced way back in time was going on people had very very advanced astronomical knowledge and they were using it to to do maps and to do all this sort of stuff and maybe that's that knowledge is something that gets encoded and sort of put into these civilizations at a later date and it might explain some of the commonalities we see i think that's and I think your your work also fits into that that area. Like this, there's, it's a clue that someone was paying close attention to the world, and they were doing it in a very sophisticated way that requires mathematics and all these other things that we generally don't associate with civilization. Because of course, of course, Gobleki Tepe supposedly is before the date for civilization to start. It's even around before organized agriculture started. It's or around the same date. So, yeah, I think there's. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so it's a rabbit hole. <laughs> You, you can go on for it, go on Ever. about it for forever. Yeah, there, there is so much to um, to talk about. Uh, so yes, uh, people were were smart back then. They were as smart as us. I don't think we have changed particularly uh, in the last forty thousand years. I think the, the I think the cave art kind of demonstrates that anyway, yeah. because it's really sophisticated. And um, the, the archaeologists have found bone flutes yep. that go back. It's, almost as, as long as that so 
you know, if, you talk, if you're talking about making a musical instrument and playing a tune in it and then painting these, these lovely um, animal figures on the walls, yeah, they were no different to us. So, and so that, it doesn't trouble me at all to think that people were good astronomers as well, that they could have noticed um, procession of the equinoxes. Yeah. Me I had too. no I... problem with that. Yeah. And then, then if, if you take that into account, then, well, of course they could have crossed the oceans. All they would need to do is build a boat, and if they can make flutes and these other things, then why couldn't they build a boat? So why can't they cross the oceans? It, it's not a problem for me. Right. And I don't understand the the sort of the um, sort Resistance. of dogmatic um, <laughs> denial that, that that you do hear a lot. I don't know whether. Well, I suspect that is the mainstream view of, of academics is that you know, this is impossible, but um, I, yeah. I don't honestly know people think that so much. So, yeah, people were smart back then. They were hardly any different to us, and they've been like been like this for at least 40,000 years and probably a lot longer than that. So this is get, that's another really interesting question about our evolution and right. our um, biological development. Right. Yeah, I mean... Uh, the, the, which, which is beyond my my uh, capability really to go into yeah yeah well i mean for me it's that, like we used to think the earliest human remains was about 195,000 years ago for quite a while the last 20 30 years and in the last i want to say four or five years there's now oh no we've shifted that to you know modern human remains found in morocco 300,000 years ago we've got we've, all the work in the creating the, the genome and looking at neanderthal genome suggests that we and neanderthal split from a common ancestor as far back as potentially 800,000 years ago there's a lot of evidence that says maybe we've been here for a bit longer and and then of course you throw that other big thing into it which is well there's something really bad happened on the planet twelve and a half thousand years ago and all of our recorded history kind of starts after that which is mm. you know it's, it's it's that what's graham say it's it we're a species with amnesia and i think we, yeah. we sort of diagnosed the knockout that was uh yeah and i think um you know what what our work shows whereas whereas before you might find a few people um, speculating about some kind of, uh, I wouldn't say advanced civilization, but higher level of civilization than has currently been anticipated right. back in these earlier times. Whilst it's whilst some people have speculated about that, I think in general amongst academics, they haven't really. Right. Uh, and I think what, what my work shows is that it's absolutely true that, that we were smart, that we were sophisticated, that we were, we were astronomers, uh, uh, musicians and all the rest of it. So now if you take 40,000 years of your time scale, well, that is, that is loads of time. That is plenty of time to, 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 to disperse across the whole world, basically. Um, because according to the, the usual view, um, mankind didn't uh, enter into the Americas until, well, I don't know, 15 to, 15 to 20,000 years ago, something yep. like that. Yep. Well, these, this Paleolithic art is twice that at each. So there's no problem with this um, system making its way into the Americas. And although it's not something I've looked at yet, I think it's something I, um, I'm very tempted to look at because mm -hmm. I think it's going to be a very rich area to see if some of the very ancient um, animal symbols that we know are used in, in, in Mesoamerica, South America, whether they are actually, uh, whether they correspond to any of the, uh, the zodiac that we've already uncovered. Because it, quite a lot of our zodiac that we currently use in the sort of in the Western scholarship, that, it, that we get that from Mesopotamia, the Bronze right. Age, so yeah. two, 3,000 years BC. Uh, but but the, I think it, it appears that the Mesopotamians, so Babylonians and Akkadians, it seems that they made quite a few changes to this very ancient zodiac. So it may be that the changes that they've made uh, weren't made in South America and Mesoamerica. We might be able to find a more direct comparison between our ancient right. zodiac and what's going on. Anyway, I haven't done that yet. So yeah. uh, if, any, if anyone wants to look at that, you know, please go ahead. Um, I, 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 it's a big, big task. I, I was going to say, I actually prepared a couple of little pictures because I've spent a fair bit of time in South America looking at stuff. I've got a couple of interesting little pictures that are very similar to some of the artwork you see at Goblecki Tepe. And also, there's some crossover to Egypt. So, if we get time, I can I can show you a couple of pictures and see see what, if you if you have any thoughts on them of some of the artwork. But that, I mean, that whole idea of of history being longer in the Americas is, I mean, Graham uh, he's just written a new book called I think America Before. I've got a copy of it here. I haven't finished reading it yet, but he, uh, it's an astonishing set of new information that really blows that Clovis first, you know, fifteen thousand year thing in the Americas out of the water. You have 
you know, blue, bluefish caves uh, carbon dated to about 25,000 years ago. There's the possibility that humans were even here as far as 130,000 years ago at the Cerruti Mastodon site, which I think is uh, San Diego. They found some mastodon bones that look like they've been broken apart with tools, which is an indicator of human presence. He also has a... Uh, Shows a, a strong link. There's some new, new peer-reviewed scientific work being done to, that shows that there's a DNA linkage between the peoples of Australasia, Australia, Papua New Guinea, and the people in South America that's missing from the people in Central and North America. So it's, it's kind of as if there was this link across the Pacific way back when where there was enough of a population shift to actually leave a, 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 a genetic indicator. Um, it's there's some real it's and I just you know we've discovered new subspecies of Homo sapiens and there's all sorts of things going on. I think we've got a our, our past is, is is more complicated than we give it credit for, and I, I'm just nothing but encouraged mm. to see more research done, uh, open-minded yeah. research done in this in this area. I mean, I'm not an expert on the very 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 early stuff, going back 130,000 years, but I mean, I suspect that could be um, not Homo sapiens. I mean, Prop, there's yeah. a possibility that that was uh, Heidelbergensis. I, I don't know what right. the the range of the different um, species of human were, but that doesn't that. have to be Homo sapiens that did that. Yeah, and uh, we, and, then, and, and and then I think it would be less controversial. I think so too. Yeah, it's a tough, it's a tough sell. While there was anything that but challenged Clovis was always considered controversial and shut down. I mean, there's sadly some accounts yeah. of some academics having their careers busted up because of it. I mean, I always Jay Harlan Bretz is a good example of a guy that I like to use, and some it's a guy that Randall Carson talks about when it comes to looking at the evidence for cataclysm. Um, in notably the channeled scablands of eastern Washington states, this incredible landscape. I've been up there and taken a look at that. But that was that was at the center of the debate between was this one flood or was this erosion over thousands of years? And he, for his whole life, was saying, "Well, this is all one flood." I've been up there looking at it, and you know, he it was not until he was on his deathbed that he kind of got vindicated. And, and the quote he said was, "Well, I'm just sad that none of my opponents are here that I can <laughs> that I can mock, you know, that I can that I can get this back mm. on them. They're all they all died." Um, but yeah, I think it's it's a it's a constantly evolving picture for me, and that's I just try to stay mm. open to to all the new evidence. Yeah, so I mean, again, going parking on about this this forty thousand year time scale, that that's a heck of a long time. It is. You think how long does it take to develop a civilization to the point where you could be building ships and and traveling across the oceans by ship rather than having to walk around the Beringian Bridge Strait? And and probably you know it's what a few thousand years maybe maybe a bit more. So, you know, over the span Egyptian. of 40,000 years, that, there's plenty of scope there for things that we know nothing about now. Plenty oh. of scope for things to have happened. Uh, and I don't see how anyone, any scientist, can be really dogmatic about a, a specific version of history right now. We just don't know enough. Uh, right. And it's, I, I suspect it's always going to be very difficult to, to pin it down completely. Yeah. I, I've, I totally agree. It's fine. I, I think... It's. I was going to say it's. I, it's. It's great to. Talk. I've talked to a couple of physicists before, and it's fant- And I find generally physicists to be very open-minded to all this stuff because I think it's got something to do with uh, when you study that fundamental nature of reality. It can kind of be stranger than any fiction when you get right down into it, and it's. It sort of opens your mind to say, well, all of this stuff's possible. Um, yeah, that's. An, that's right. Yeah. When, when <laughs> I think you're right. When you're. Yeah. When you. When as an undergraduate, you have to try and wrap your mind around quantum mechanics and oh. general relativity, <laughs> then uh, you're yeah. kind of prepared for any kind of unusual thing going on. <laughs> and and you, kind of, you kind of learn not to be too dogmatic about anything. Yeah. The yeah, world well, is a strange place. It really is. Yeah, there's plenty to explore. What's the quote? Like, if you think you understand quantum physics, you don't really understand quantum physics. Yeah, I That's love right. that. Um, <laughs> cool. But yeah, there's... Uh, I, um, what was I going to say? The... Uh, Let's see. Did you want to talk any about? We can get into the younger dryas, but one thing that's it's interesting to me in what you've done, and so we've established that a lot of these this artwork is lines up with these calendar dates and these these alignments with uh, precession of the equinox. But what's interesting about Go Go Blacky Tepe is that you say that it, it marks, it seems to mark the the younger dry specifically. So for people that I'm sure anyone who's listening to my channel, I talk about it all the time, but the Younger Dryas was this this cataclysm that occurred around 12,800 years ago, um, as shown by lots and lots of sources, notably the ice core uh, temperature graphs. In fact, I I've, I've enjoy I, I know you have a slide that sh- that compares uh, Vostok in Antarctica uh, ice core yeah. samples to the Greenland sample. I love that. Um, Do you want to see it? Yeah, please. I I love that. Uh, it's a great way okay. to talk about this because. Um, it's, right. Let us find. 
because it gets into some of the effects on uh, on the planet and in South America in general. But the, the theory goes that right now, Younger Dryas was most likely the, uh, caused by a, a series of cosmic impacts. There's and I get a lot of um, a lot of feedback and commentary about people talking about many other sources. I, and in my mind, I think there's room for more than one cataclysm in this period, including if you include the Bolling Alarod, which was just before the Younger Dryas. I think there's it's not just one event. I think we've got room for plenty several different events, uh, whether they, you know, coronal mass ejections, possibly supernovas, there's, there's a few other different potential culprits, but it seems like the most evidence right now supports uh, the idea that it was a cosmic impact. And in fact, they found a massive couple of craters, in fact, under Greenland's ice, and that they still yet to date fairly accurately, but it certainly fits, it seems to early indications say that it's within the window for a younger dry ice impact. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a possibility that those are that is the smoking gun but we need to like you say we need to wait for the science to be done on those yeah. craters so um yeah so this is the younger dryas uh, impact event right here at the beginning or i should explain this is this is time going backwards from basically the present day back 40,000 years so uh let's see the the lion man of holstein stadel cave was being worked on around about here <laughs> way back and then way. between there uh, and us we've got in the northern hemisphere Okay, this is the this is a Greenland ice core. Yep. We've got these massive fluctuations in in uh, climate and therefore temperature, mm -hmm. and they are so incredibly uh, large. You know, we're talking about ten, sometimes fifteen degrees Huge. Celsius, happening within what appears to be you know less than a hundred years, maybe less than a decade. Yeah. Now that there's a there is a paper on the Younger Dryas, um, the the sort of beginning of the Younger Dryas, which analyzes uh, one of the north, uh, so one of the Greenland ice cores down to sub-annual resolution. Yep. yep. And it, it, it appears to even detect a dramatic shift in climate within a single year, <laughs> according to this ice core. And as, yeah. uh, as, as I understand it, that cannot be replicated by any um, climate simulation unless you put in some kind of catastrophic event. Right. Which, so that it kind of indicates that there was something big happened here and that's just one of the pieces of yep. evidence there's so much there's in my mind this is absolutely clear that the event happened yep. that it was some kind of impact probably a um a fragmented comet yep. uh, whether it was those greenland craters we don't know but it, it could have been yeah but it's there's... absolutely clear that it happened that it, and it caused these amazing effects not just the the the, the drop in climate and uh for a long time there has been this debate about what about uh, megafaunal extinctions, we can oh, get into yes. that whole. Yeah. What, what causes? There's been a whole series of megafaunal extinctions occurring across the last, this sort of latter part of the last ice age, and it seems that they correlate with these rapid fluctuations in climate, which is perfectly mm -hmm. sensible. It, it makes absolute sense that a change of this magnitude and of this suddenness would would lead to um, extinctions. Extinctions, because probably because. The, the food just isn't there for, for many of the animals anymore. The, you know, the, yeah. the, um, the vegetation will have shifted or disappeared. Uh, and then there's a whole cluster of extinctions at the Younger Dryas event. And that, that's, that's been a, a thorny issue for over mm. 50 years amongst uh, anthropologists, well, not anthropologists, amongst paleontologists. Yeah. Uh, and so there's this, then come, along comes this new idea, 2007, that it was, a, it was an impact, actually, that, that may have caused this particular group of extinctions here. Uh, and so the idea, I think, is that the impact somehow released or it led to the release of a whole load of meltwater mm -hmm. from uh, from the, the the ice sheet across North America at that time. And so it was a, like a, a combination effect. You had perhaps dust in the atmosphere from the impact. You had a whole load of meltwater released into the North Atlantic Ocean. And that together, it, it seems, would be able to... Um, result in this uh, dramatic you, change in climate there's a there were a number of effects uh including 10 something like 10 percent of the biomass of the planet was on fire as a result of this at least that's where they've indicated that spike in charcoal and th this this comes from the south the south actually south southern hemisphere uh younger dryas um, analysis because it's an interesting like i just this graph with the mega we'll come back to the megafaunal thing but i like i like how you there is definitely this this a high degree of fluctuation in this, what seems to be the northern hemisphere readings, as opposed to the Antarctic regions, I was going to ask yeah. you: do you, Is that due to 
either i think it to me it's either i don't know if this corresponds with glaciation because it's i know the glaciers tend to advance and recede in their normal northern hemisphere more so than the south given the tilt of the earth or whether or not this has anything to do with like milankovitch cycles because i know that's the that's that's the 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 explanation for why we go through these periodic ice ages and and i guess not well we're in an ice age now but you know, glacial maximum versus glacial minimums it's to do with these periodic and very complicated sort of motions of the of the earth as it rolls around the sun and angles shift and the orbit yeah. actually isn't perfectly circular it shifts a bit as well yeah I, you know I, I don't think even that is completely sorted out i think right. um the Milan, Milan, milankovitch cycles is one idea and i think it is a, is a good explanation for at least some of the climate change but i, I I don't think I think we're probably looking at multiple effects here that there's not there isn't just one explanation for yeah. these things. And uh, so another one which I quite uh, like, but um, I've yet to you know, I'd like to, I'd like someone to actually do some good scientific research on this is uh, dusting by comets. So the, 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 the uh, Klub Napier yes. theory uh, that a giant comet in the, in the in the inner solar system, which is what we're talking about here, essentially, mm -hmm. that would um, create a lot of dust in the inner solar system and that would prevent some sunlight reaching earth and that could then um, cool at least to a, a small extent um the planet the earth that, that would change the climate to, to a degree so I, I just wonder how much of that is involved as well uh, i'm not a climate scientist so i can't tell you exactly um how this all fits together but anyway going back to your point we've got this younger dryas event which, which is now is, is absolutely clear that it was caused by a cosmic act, uh, impact. Yeah, I agree. But according to this theory of a giant comet, we should see other impacts. So for the, for the duration that this comet was, was in the inner solar system, it now seems to have disappeared. We can't see a single comet there anymore. We have Enki's comet, which is, a, which is probably just a, a, a fragment of this uh, large original comet. That's a anyway, torrid meteor stream, yeah. That's, the, that's right. Yeah. So it seems that this giant comet has decayed now almost entirely. It's left a few large fragments uh, and a lot of dust and the torrid meteor stream. But, you know, based just purely on a, um, on a sort of a, a crude statistical estimate, we would expect there to be other events, maybe not as large as the Younger Dryas. So, so I'm, I'm then thinking, well, if we're expecting other events, what are these? You know, are, are these yeah. just a natural part uh, these sort of, they, I think they're called Dansgaard Oshka events. Are these just a natural part of Earth's climate, or are they actually triggered by some external event? Perhaps it could be a, a comet impact, perhaps it's a supervolcano, although we don't see any supervolcanoes in this time period. So, more likely, it's some kind of comet impact associated with um, Cosmic event, this tor yeah. torrid meteor stream again. So, I just wonder what, you know, what is it actually triggers these things? We know this, we think it's got something to do with changes in the ocean circulation right but what is it that actually starts that what off triggers that yeah yeah it's an interesting thing i mean so do you know burkle are you familiar with burkle crater have you heard of i've that heard event? of it yeah yeah, yeah. so five yeah. i think it's five thousand years ago and in fact i think it's some people say that it, it, it might be the source for the biblical flood because burkle crater is a 30 mile crater on the bottom of the indian ocean and they've and they measured that by looking at the the i guess the 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 ripples on madagascar and on western australia and some of those ripples contain debris from the ocean floor that has been that dates the the, the crater and and you can see like the the sort of splash damage and these giants and i'm like these these hills are three four hundred feet high and they're all they're all left over from from this one big impact and it would have washed north up into the middle east which was you know, around the time that uh, that that whole uh, religion was evolving. Interestingly enough, I also think that our religion and many of our other religions are tightly connected to the zodiac. I think we, we essentially have these sun cults, and that we have um, uh, a lot of um, uh, correspond. We, we we encode all of this data into our, our myths and religions. I think essentially Christianity is a sun cult um, from a long list of the latest in a long list of sun cults. But Burkle Crater was, I think, I'm not sure what day if they if they have that. If they've nailed that down to being like a torrid uh, event, I know Tunguska was was in the the right period of time to be a torrid event. But yeah, like you say, we know Enki's out there. But I'm it's it's I'm, I'm encouraged to see NASA doing more and more to map. And I think NASA now agrees with the the theory that there was this cosmic impact coming from the torrid stream. And it, I think to me, it's like that's the the purpose of trying to reevaluate our history to, to some degree. Is like 
there's some lessons learned like and i think there's some of these ancient cultures and these events they're speaking to us and telling us a message and it's only one that we can read once we get advanced enough to be able to do it which we're doing and you're doing and and i think that's the whole point should be like all right let's pay attention to what the the real sort of priority should be and where we should be spending our dollars because i think it's uh yeah. ultimately we need to solve that problem because i mean yeah, co- because- cosmic impacts cause all the other natural disasters i mean but and they're the one mm. thing we could probably do something about yeah coming back to i mean Berkel crater i i'm not sure how much science has been done on that so i'm not even sure if there is a confirmed crater in that particular location so uh i think as as far as i know it's kind of wait and see but i, I could be wrong okay. i don't know yeah, exactly I'm not, what's the, my sources aren't um, peer reviewed it's randall carlson <laughs> and a few other people but yeah right okay. randall randall's ve- i'd love to actually see a conversation between you and randall someday i think that would be mm. that would be epic yeah because he's oh, very be scientific. I mean, he does nothing but read papers, and that guy is just—he's um, mm. a machine. So, yeah. So, I mean, I think you—you you kind of be a bit wary about Berkeley Crater. It might okay. turn out to be correct. Sure. I don't know, but I'm not, I don't think enough science has been done on that, with that one yet. Um, as for the sun, the sun cult or religion <laughs> based around the sun cult. Well, I mean, what uh, what our work shows is that yes, you know, back forty thousand years, people were observing the sun, observing the solstices and equinoxes. So yeah, that that's. We've kind of proven that there was this sun cult, and yeah. it's extremely ancient. Now, whether that is the motivation or whether that led directly into Christianity, I, I think that um, this is where Gebekli Tepe is, plays an important role and, and the Younger Trias event, because I suspect that, and I write about this in my book, I suspect that um, it, that, that whole Younger Trias event kind of catalyzed a new religion or a new a slightly different flavor of religion right more more catastrophic if you like more fearful and uh, and i think that is kind of where our modern religions are more directly related to uh, so i think there's a little bit of there's a bit of sort of solar solar cycle uh, kind of um, ceremonies there yep. but on top of that you've got this all of this catastrophism right. and i think a lot of these a lot of these myths are probably related to um comets essentially yeah. i think you know most of our modern religions and the ancient ones i think essentially are comet yeah, cults i mean they, they started from a comet cult I absolutely along agree. with along with all this astronomy mixed in with it yeah there's a, i mean there's no end of book of revelation talks about like just literally impacts coming into the land and the sea and the rivers i mean there's they, there's almost literal descriptions of it you get the same thing in the vedic traditions in india you have uh, no end of of uh, South American and Mesoamerican cultures that talk about wars in the sky and the fiery dragon. I mean, there's so much comet symbolism and catastrophism that that, that comes from these. It's like is, you almost can't find an exception to it. Almost every yeah. creation story talks mm. about you know massive either either flooding or fire, which are both would have yeah. engulfed the planet essentially when this That's cataclysm right. happened. I mean, if you if you rule out cosmic catastrophism, then those myths. Don't make, make don't make any, any sense. sense, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you think what are, what are they on about? Why are all these people across the whole world saying the same thing, which doesn't make any sense? Yeah. But when you when you say okay, well let's let's consider catastrophism, then it makes just perfect sense. Right. And uh, so you've got all these these myths, and 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 actually uh, Plato tells us about this correlation or this kind of this mythical interpretation of real events yep. in his Timaeus book. So there he's talking about the Phaethon myth. Uh, which is a perfect description of of this theory of coherent catastrophism by by Klub and Napier. These yep. recurrent cycles of catastrophes caused by bodies in the heavens crashing down to earth. It's exactly it's so it's so well described. And in that tale, he says, although this has you know, he, he describes the Phaethon myth, and he says, although this has the uh, the appearance of a myth, it is in fact you know, a real event. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> it all ties I- in. I, 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 yeah, I think so too. I think there's a lot of, that's how we, I mean, it's almost as if we're trying to, we, we, there was an effort to encode this knowledge into myth and legend because that's how, if we were blasted back to a stone age or something like that, I mean, and those sort of campfire tales are the ways that we would, we would transmit knowledge and data through the, through, through the, through generations. I mean, I often like to think about what if this happened today to us? I mean, if we had a younger dryas impact today, I mean, it would shatter our civilization, something that large. I mean, we'd survive. I don't think it would probably wipe us all out. There's enough of us to, that we would survive in pockets. But within a couple of generations, you're talking about we're probably going to be telling campfire stories about plasma TVs and cell phones. Like we could, this yeah. we'd magical device where we could 
show each other across the world and like nah bullshit you know you, you know it's, it's it would it wouldn't take long before us to, we started telling these tales and trying to encode that knowledge just in sort of that's right uh, and i i i kind of think that people going back in a really, really long way um they were as smart as us and there probably would have been some people who prefer or who are more inclined towards a, a religious or mythical experience yeah. and other people who are more inclined to a matter of fact, no, this is what I saw and uh, we just have to describe it this way, just like we have today. You know, there are exactly. half the world, half the world is kind of religious and the other half isn't. I suspect it was the same thing. And so you've got probably got these parallel cultures, one of which is describing it in myths and the other which is describing it in probably rational t- more yeah. rational terms yeah. and they probably supported each other along with the fact that the stars are hardly changing i think right. that's that's also a very key thing something that i think um is, is hard for some people to to, to sort of um to accept right. is how how can how can a system last for forty thousand years at least without hardly changing at all uh well the answer well, one answer at least is that the stars hardly change or at least the zodiacal stars right. constellations yeah, have I mean, hardly changed in 40,000 years. And that's persisted. Like we, like I said, we still have that system in place today. I mean, we, we, the one thing that's very constant throughout human civilization, as we know, and even prehistory, this, this, this concept of the zodiac and, and mapping, mapping the heavens. As I said, I think our, and if you go back and look at a lot of the sort of pre-Renaissance artwork and, and Christian artwork, you often see you know, Jesus has the cross behind him, and it's the cross of the zodiac. He's twelve disciples, I think, essentially represent the twelve constellations as we know it. The whole birth and creation myth, with the three kings pointing to where the sun rises, that's uh, it's a straight analogy for where the the stars of Orion's belt point to where the sun rises on that date. I mean, and the whole the whole three days dead that that represents in northern latitudes the the idea of where the sun pauses on the horizon for three days around December 25th before it starts moving north again that signals the 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 start of warmer days and longer days which again in those early times we had a much tighter relationship to the movement of the stars and particularly the sun because the sun meant everything the sun meant spring and food and plenty and when we go into winter those are times of hardship and darkness so I think there's just just no end of investigation on that side that to, to ties this data in we're still doing the same thing in a lot of ways we're still f- essentially worshiping the, the the celestial environment that's because that's how we mark everything yeah i mean like, like you I, it's it's really uh, it's really fun to, to yeah. sort of think about these connections and to speculate about how religions might have yeah. um progressed one from the other and how they kind of split off and branched and uh and that's fine, you know. Enjoy that kind of thing as well. But at the end of the day, I think you've always got to go back to the science and think: well, do. what do we actually? What, is, what has actually been scientifically? What are the facts? You know, what are, yeah. what are the what, what is the evidence? And then try and build your case around that. Because if you start with, if you start with the myth first, or if you start with trying to interpret myth first, then you can go in any direction. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, that's. And, yeah, it's it's a it's actually in my in my I've been writing a script for a new, a new video and one of the things I, I spend a bit of time talking about is specifically that I mean science is just it's a process right it's a method it, it's how you get from sets of facts and observations at A and arrive at a conclusion B I think a lot of people start at conclusion B and then work backwards how does how do I make a path that kind of sort of fits the stuff that we know at A because I like the idea of B and I'll dismiss anything that 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 doesn't match conclusion B along the way and that's kind of that's not really science at that point. It's it's you know well, it's it's, the, it's the key thing about science uh, is statistics, and yeah. so um, this is what I uh, what, what I find interesting. You know, when I talk to some of my academic, um, I wouldn't say colleagues, but other Peers. academics yeah. who happen to think that they are scientists, but um, they don't deal with data or the, the statistical analysis of data. Well, then that's not science. Right. Anything which the only thing which is science, empirical science is the statistical analysis of data. Right. And so I think that, that's what you have to be, that's where you have to fix everything to. Uh, right. And you, you can build your story around around that. And that's that's a problem, I think, that you, that you see uh, with um, some aspects of archaeology. And I, I need to be careful here because I think there are a lot of good archaeologists who, do yep. a lot, do, who actually do science, you know, proper science, uh, more on the measurement end. And then you've got a, a, a different flavors of archaeologists who are more into the interpretation. And I think that's where that's where you get into problems yeah. because 
they stop being scientific at that point. I, I, I would agree. Yeah, I, and I think then I, I'm the same. Like I'm, all I'm saying, I'm a look. I'm a YouTube guy, right? I mean, I don't really have a stake in it. I don't have a position in this. I, I describe my position as essentially yelling commentary from the sidelines. I'm not, you know, I'm not. <laughs> and a lot of what I do, is speculation, and but I'm deeply interested in all of that. But I do want to say the same thing. Like I think all the work that a lot of these archaeologists do is fantastic, um, and particularly a lot of the the, the paleo archaeo, like the 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 the, the archaeology as it relates to some of the, the stuff around the Younger Dryas and analysis of um, uh, sedimentary layers and, and that's getting into that specifically empirical measurement of data. Is, yeah, that's, that's solid work, all of it. Yeah. I mean, basically, science is asking the question, what is the most likely explanation for this data? That, right. that is science. That's all we're trying to do is find the most likely explanation for the measured data. Yeah, yeah, uh, and and so that's why probability and statistics comes into it because it's all about what is the most likely explanation. Right. Therefore, you have to use statistics. Right. Okay, so one, if you can't, yeah, then it's not science. Go on, yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, no, you're right. Sorry, you've probably got a little bit of lag here, given we're on other sides of the world right now. Uh, one thing I did want to just touch on, um, which was, and I know we we were about to go there, and then I derailed it, derailed us, which is not unusual for me. Uh, the megalithic, the, the, the extinction event, so around that are tied around the megafauna, sorry, megalithic, megafauna um, extinction events tied around the end of the Younger Dryas. Now, this is fascinating to me because it's uh, the, the, we've done a lot of work analysing, as you say, that there's no doubt the Younger Dryas cataclysm happened. There's more than 50 sites that, we've been, that have been dug up and we've looked at sedimentary layers and they all sort of correspond to this Younger Dryas boundary layer. It also... Uh, it, it also, you know, it's, it's also now being confirmed in the Southern Hemisphere. And one of the things that I found super dramatic and, and just to give people an idea of, of how cataclysmic this event was, including the Southern Hemisphere, is that, that the recent study in Southern Chile suggests, and you, they look at like the spore um, remnants from animal dung uh, remains from large animals. And, and it shows like an 80% uh, extinction rate of all the large animals in that area, just almost precisely cut off at that younger dryas boundary layer not only that you had plant life and the the, the all of the uh, seeds and density of seeds and material from plants was like a, a reduced by like a 10x measure for a long period of time before it started to recover and it all just happens on this one sort of clean line that corresponds with that younger dryas boundary layer and the idea that i think you touched on it with your grammarica show i know it's something you talk about in your youtube videos but the idea that this was human uh, in origin and that we overhunted all of these species is it's it's I've always found that to be fairly implausible I mean I, we couldn't even kill off the buffaloes in North America we, and we had firearms and we tried um, we didn't quite manage it and you're talking about cave bears and mammoths and any number of like probably millions of, of these huge animals just small groups of paleo Indian hunters uh, I don't think so <laughs> yeah I think you're right so I mean, there, uh, as I say in the in the book, there are the, there are two main theories about the extinction of these uh, megafauna over the sort of tail end of the last ice age, and like you just said, one is uh, overhunting, and uh, as you just said, South America kind of debunks that because, as far as we know, there weren't many, if any, people in South America. Maybe there were some, but they weren't. They couldn't. Well. The evidence is that there isn't there weren't many at that time. So how could they have um, depopulated an entire continent of eighty percent of its megafauna in a short space of time? No, yeah. it's, it's ridiculous. It's, and and Africa tells you that that right. it is utterly non, it, it must be nonsense right. because Africa is where uh, apparently uh, you know, the, the human species or Homo sapiens developed, and yet Africa is the one continent left on Earth that has retained more of its megafauna than any other. So the yeah. correlation. Uh, the correlation just isn't there, and so of course what happens is that then once you know, some uh, some academics once they get this idea into their head, they then think, well, there has to be a reason for that, and so they come up with another idea, which is that all oh, the the megafauna in in Africa um, <laughs> were used to human presence, whereas the megafauna in South America were tame. Uh, you know, all, all of these fierce creatures were just perfectly tame. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. And then you've got then you've got the the um, uh, over chill so you've got the over kill which we just talked about and over chill which is that it's, it's climate change now climate change i think is when you when you see the the, the massive changes in climate that there have been i think that's a more reasonable explanation but once again um south america uh kind of debunks that that idea because in south america 
um, sorry, in Africa debunks that idea because, you know, Africa is um, is a southern hemisphere nation, but it still yeah. retained all of its uh, megafauna. megafauna. So, so, so there there is this kind of inconsistency between these two yeah. Yeah. Uh, stories that doesn't add up. There must have been something else. That's right. uh, and it may even have been a dominant effect. Um, so, it, you know, I'm not saying that, that, that I obviously do think that climate, massive climate change plays an effect. I think that human hunting has a much smaller effect, probably sure. has a, an effect. Yeah. But perhaps there's an even more important or dominant effect, which um, we need to think about, which In, is impact um, cosmic impacts. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's not only the, the great chill, but one of the interesting things that came out of that South American Younger Dry study is that South America at that time didn't suffer the same chill at the same time. That's shown in the Greenland ice cores. It actually, the climate actually warmed a little bit for a little while. And they think that has to do with the flow on effect from the conveyor belt systems and the global connection of climate, that type of thing. But yeah, it's, 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 it's unusual for that to have happened. I mean, there's, there's many other indicators that say that something happened at that period. I mean, are, are you familiar with the, the energy paradox for the glaciers? Like the, the, it's the, uh, all of the, the, uh, the ice sheets across North America and Northern Europe. The fact that those, where did the energy come from to melt those in such a short period of time, given that we know through meltwater pulses 1A and 1B, when the sea levels rose, due, like dramatically rose due to the melting of those glaciers. So there's a, do you, are you familiar with what I'm talking about, the energy? No, I'm, I'm so, not familiar with that, no. So it's an interesting um, problem is, is that the, the, and this is as I've heard it described, is that there is not enough energy for terrestrial source. If you took those glaciers, the amount of ice, we know where it is and we know the rate at which water melts. And if you took all those glaciers and just plopped them down on the, on the equator at Sumatra or something where the warmest water was at, the time, in the, at, at that time during the ice age, those glaciers, all that ice would still be here. Take, it would still take 30,000 plus years to fully melt. And the fact that they're up in the cold area and they melted over what seems to be only a couple thousand years is it's a it's a astonishing amount of energy required mm. to do that. And, and that energy, it's very difficult to make a case that that energy came from any terrestrial sources. You have to inject that from something else. Uh, I think you have to be you have to be a bit careful there. So sure. you've got you've got the um, these I know I know about melt meltwater pulses 1A and 1B, and I think it's thought that the meltwater was already stored in, a, in massive lakes. Uh, so we get into the, the glacial lake models. Yes, there's some interesting... Gla that's right. Yeah. So if you've already got all of this meltwater, then obviously you don't need to make it instantly from right. some kind of thermal source. It, it's already there. It just needs to be loosed right. or let loose there's into huge, the ocean. There's huge problems with the glacial uh, lake models in terms of what it right. would have taken in Lake Missoula. Again, yep. Randall Carlson is a great one to look at this. But the idea that there was an ice dam that was seven – it would have had to have been seven miles wide and a couple thousand feet tall. And we've seen mm. several uh, glacial ice dams. We've had – we've done measurements on them. And they break long before – I mean, just a pinhole in that, in that seven-mile wide, couple thousand feet tall um, ice dam would have created would – have, would, have, would have let loose all of that – Water and the, so ice dams fail way before that pressure could ever build up because the water pressure at the bottom of that is just tremendous. It's um, mm -hmm. ice dams don't. We've never seen ice dams that behave like that in our times. The ones that we've measured. So there's some issues with that ice dam theory. Not only that, but the the, the theory also goes that it was it reformed several times and flooded again, which is like. Um, it's sort of it's it's just that argument in and that's going on at the moment. Was this one event? Was this a series of floods? It's it's not decided mm -hmm. yet, but I I've the I, I I see a few issues with the theory that oh it was just mm. the Lake Missoula one you know series of floods. And then of course there is um so you've got melt meltwater pulses one A and one B, and then around at the, at the time of the Younger Dryas event itself, there is hardly any. Well, it depends. There is conflicting evidence for one. sea level rise at that time. So there are some papers which say there may have been a few meter rise in the sea in the oceans, which would be massive yeah. if that yeah. happened in you know one day, uh, or you know within a short space of time. Yeah. And there are other papers which which look at other evidence and say, well, no, it, it was really continuous and there wasn't any um, sudden change right at the Younger Dryas event. So right. uh, I'm I'm kind of looking at the evidence and just and I, i'm not really sure what it says yet yeah. about uh this uh, na the nature of some kind of thermal source needed at that time okay that's a good point there's um but i'm not i'm not a glaciologist though yeah no neither, neither am i by any means i i i try i 
I feel like I don't have enough time to research all the things I'd like mm. to along with living my life, but it's that's I, I dig into what I can. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, you're right. It, it's such a multifaceted problem. So right, many absolutely. things. Where you've got the megafauna, you've got the geology, you've got the archaeology, you've got the astronomy. It's, it is very, very difficult to try and learn enough about every area to, 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 make, to make it all make sense. Um, and I've tried, I've tried to do that to some extent <laughs> in my book. Yes. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, 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 full of, I'm, I'm completely aware that there will probably be parts of my book which you know, a complete expert in that field would, would look at that sentence I've just written and say, well, that's not quite right, is it? Um, so anyway, we'll, we'll see. It, it's, um, it, it is very difficult for one person to, to gather all that information. It, I, I, I bet it is. And that's, I guess that's the nature of discourse, right? I, I, I actually have your book on order. I've got your other papers. I'm, I am going to read it as well. Um, and I, I look forward to that. I think, uh, I think if nothing else, it's going to advance the conversation, right? It's a key. I think it's a key piece in, in moving this whole picture forward. And I'm just thankful that you've, you're doing the work you did. And thanks for, uh, for, for doing that. And thanks for coming on and, and talking to little old me here on my YouTube channel as well. I really appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you very much for, for inviting me. No, it's been a real pleasure. Yeah, yeah let's good, do it again. Good conversation. Right. And for anyone that's watching, please do. You can see below in the video, you'll see a link to both Martin's YouTube. Go and subscribe to him and take a look at his book. I'll provide a link to that here as well. So thank you very much, Martin. Thank you very much, Ben. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.